In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today again, like we've seen in previous weeks, we read readings where Christ is speaking to his disciples about how he was getting ready to leave them, and he's preparing them for this. He's preparing them for what will happen uh, after, after he leaves. And we read in John 16, verse 20, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. And this is really the state of the apostles at the time, is that they were weeping, and they were lamenting, and they were sad, because Christ was leaving them. But Christ promises them that their sorrow will be turned into joy. And this is the state of Christians on the earth as well right now. That maybe we are weeping and lamenting. Maybe we feel that God has abandoned us here to the, in this place. But our weeping and our sorrow will be turned into joy because God has not abandoned us or has not left us. So we want to speak today about Christian joy. And to start, we'll speak about some types of godly sorrow that he allows us to experience here in the world that will be turned into joy. The kind of sorrow that God says will produce good things for us. The kind of sorrow that God intends for us to experience on the earth. There are some people that believe that any kind of sorrow, any kind of pain, or any kind of suffering on the earth is, is, should not happen. That, that, that this is against the commandment of God. And certainly God never intended for us to experience the sorrow when he, when he created us in perfection in the Garden of Eden and that we had everything that we needed and that we were in communion with God continually. There was no reason for us to have any kind of sorrow or any kind of pain because we were already in complete communion and union with God. And now, after our separation from God, the sorrow we experience is as a result of that separation. And the sorrow that we experience is God uses it to restore us again to Him. Just as He says here to the disciples that maybe you will have weeping and lamenting and sorrow for a time, but your sorrow will be turned into joy when we are restored again to God. So what are some types of godly sorrow? There's the sorrow leading to hope. The sorrow leading to hope. In John 6, 21, it says, A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for a joy that a human being has been born into the world. Any woman that's been pregnant as a pregnant mother knows that there is sorrow and pain during the time of childbirth. And even from before childbirth, being pregnant in itself is painful and, and uncomfortable. And leading up to that moment of delivery where there is a lot of pain. And yet, the joy comes after the pain. The joy comes and we endure the pain because of the good thing that will come afterward. It would be very hard to tell people that you have to go through the pain of childbirth and then after the pain, you get nothing. And then you just go back again and then maybe keep repeating that same cycle of pain over and over and over with no reward, with nothing to look forward to in the end. And this is the kind of worldly sorrow that some people live in. Some people live in a kind of a sorrow that is a perpetual sorrow with no hope, that there is nothing after this life, there is nothing to look forward to, that is simply pain and suffering and abandonment and all these emotions we might experience at times here in the world, and there is nothing to look forward to in the end. But the kind of sorrow that we have is like this pregnant woman who suffers for a time but has hope in some great reward at the end. So like a woman before childbirth, we have to remember that several things. One, that there will be an end to our sorrow. There will be the time, just as Christ said, your weeping will be turned into joy, your sorrow will be turned into joy. There will be an end. Whatever sorrows we face, there will be an end. Also, that we will enjoy the fruit, the reward that is at the end. That there will be some reward for us, and we will enjoy this reward. And this reward, once we receive it, it will make us forget completely the pain that we had. Just as a woman, after she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the pain of her, of her delivery, of the childbirth, of anything, because she is joyful that there is a child born into the world. Also, that we will live in forever in joy. There is no fear of going back again to the pain that we have been in, but that we will live with Christ forever. So this is the sorrow leading to hope that even though we might have sorrow here in the world for a time, we have hope that there, there will be a time where this will end, that this sorrow will end, and that we will have joy in the presence of Christ and being with Him always. Also, the sorrow leading to joy. In verse 22, we read, Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take away from you. And this is very important. It says, no one will take away from you. 
The worldly joys that we have, it's very easy for other people to take them away from us. When you think of anything good that might have happened to us on any given day, and, and we have a good attitude and we're smiling and we're happy, and then someone comes and says something to us or does something to us that ruins our day. How easy is it for this type of joy, this worldly joy, to be taken away from us so easily by anyone, even strangers, people that we do not know, that they can come and take away the joy that we have because it is a worldly joy. It is a joy based simply on how I feel in the moment, not a joy based on where I will be and what my eternal life will look like. So this kind of sorrow that we have today, we, we should temper it by remembering always that we will have this eternal joy and not to focus and meditate so much on the pains that we have, but to trust that God will take this away and that we will have eternal joy with him. Today, maybe we feel like God is distant from us. We feel like we cannot see him directly. We do not know him face to face. We hear about him. We believe in him. We pray to him. We experience him, but in an indirect way. But the day will come when we see God plainly, clearly, face to face, where we speak to him and he responds immediately to us in a way that we can immediately discern and understand and that our union with him will be complete. This is what will bring us joy because we are waiting for this moment where we will be reunited with our Lord. Also, the sorrow leading to purification. The sorrow leading to purification. Why is it that God allows sorrow? Because God could have easily prevented any type of sorrow. He could have prevented any kind of pain in our lives. But he wants us to be purified. As we read in Malachi chapter 3, verse 3, He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. That God wants to refine us and purify us as he would ref refine pure, pure metals, silver and gold. That he would change us to become pure in his sight so that we would have no obstacle between us and him. Remember the thing that separated us from him and the thing that brought us all the sorrow that we have now in the world is because of our sin. This is the separator. This is the thing that separates us from God. So as long as we are living in sin, we will be separated from him. So God, in order to purify us, why is he doing this? He's doing it because he wants to remove the obstacle that is between us and him and reunite us with himself. So the result of purification is that we are more Christ-like and that we are more in union with Christ. This is why we should accept these kinds of trials that God allows in our life because he is doing what is right for us. Also, the sorrow leading to repentance. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Again, why? Because when I sorrow in a godly way, I repent and I go back to the author and the source of life. God, who is the source of life, when I repent of my sins, I draw near to him who is life. This is what brings me salvation, and this is what brings me joy. But the worldly sorrow is a sorrow that produces death, because it has no hope. There is no point to that sorrow. It's a sorrow of depression, of despair, of sadness, of just simply feeling that my life here is of no purpose and of no meaning, and I have no fulfillment or contentment, and I have no hope for a better future. Everything looks bleak and dark. This is why it produces death. This is why people commit suicide, because of this type of a sorrow. It is a, a sorrow so, so powerful that it causes people to take their own life because they have no hope. But the sorrow of God, the, the godly sorrow, is a sorrow unto life, not a sorrow unto death. It's a sorrow that recognizes that God is present and that God has not abandoned us and he continues to be with us. Ecclesiastes 7.3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. This goes completely against maybe our, our, our common sense and certainly what the world says, that sorrow is better than laughter. Who of us wants to be sad? Instead, we want to be happy and joyful and laughing. But why does King Solomon say this, that a sad countenance, the heart is made better? Because it is through seriously looking at our lives, at ourselves, that we find the things that are separating us from God, the things that are preventing us from having the true and fulfilling life that God wants us to have. Not because God wants us to be sad, because actually heaven is a place where there is no sorrow. Heaven is a place where there is no sadness. So why is it that sorrow is beneficial now? 
It's because we identify the reality that we're in. Sometimes we want to live in a fake type of reality. We want to imagine that we are living in a place that is really so different from where we actually are. We are living in a place that has been corrupted. We are living in a place that has been desolate because of our sin. If we don't identify this, if we don't realize that there is something we need to do to repent, there's something that we need to do to remain focused and undistracted, that to realize that the devil continues to wage war against us. Imagine if you are in a war, how you will, will you let your guard down for even for a moment, or will you always be aware that there is an enemy? There is an enemy who is attacking us. And maybe this will bring us stress. Maybe this will bring us sadness. Maybe this will bring us a sense of tension because there is an enemy. But to imagine that the enemy doesn't exist and to imagine that there is no war, maybe yes, we will, we will be deluded into believing that everything is fine and we will be happy, but it is a lie. It is a lie. So the kind of joy that God wants us to have is not the kind of um, superficial joy that maybe we find ourselves in in the world, but it's an abiding joy in God himself, not because there are no problems, but because God has conquered and God will continue to conquer and allow us to have victory over the devil. What does Ecclesiastes say about earthly happiness? When King Solomon, who had access to every worldly joy, he says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from, my, from, a, from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. And indeed, all was vanity, and grasping for the wind, there was no profit under the sun. King Solomon answers this question for us, maybe all of us who have limited resources, who believe that if only I was able to do a certain thing, if I, only if I was able to have access to a certain kind of thing in the world, then, my, then finally my joy would be complete, I would have no problems and everything would go uh, uh, you know, very well for me. But King Solomon is actually the example that proves this wrong because he had absolutely everything that anyone could imagine, whether it be possessions or relationships or servants or comforts, he had absolutely everything, and yet he was completely unsatisfied when he reached to the end of this, that there was actually nothing. He called it vanity and grasping for the wind, that we're trying to attain something that doesn't exist. This is, this is in the nature of man, that we have this sense of desiring in us. It's some desiring that cannot be fulfilled, and we believe that we can fulfill it by filling our lives with people and things, but this gap this desire that we have in ourselves can only be filled by God. And once we find this and we realize this and we begin to fill it with God, then we are satisfied and content. But when we try to fill it with anything else, we will continue feeling hunger. We will continue to hunger for him. What are some sources of godly joy then that God gives us? We talked about the sorrow, the kinds of godly sorrow. What are some types of godly joy? The first is the word of God. In Psalm 119, 162, King David says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. And we have to ask ourselves this, like when we read the word of God, do we rejoice in it as one who finds great treasure? If, if, if I could choose, you know, if my, I heard this story one time, if, if somebody's house is burning down and you only had time to run in and get one thing and come out again, what would it be? You know, would it be the Bible? Well, do we see this as treasure? Do we see the word of God as treasure? Do we find ourselves privileged that we would even be able to own a Bible and to be able to read the word of God, that these are the words of God himself to us? What is it about the word of God that brings joy? The first is it tells us about heaven because we speak about the, the joy that is to come, that we might have sorrow now, but that we are looking forward to joy. Where is this joy? When we read about heaven, we read about eye has not seen nor ear heard nor, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which he has prepared for those who love him. This kind of language, when we read about the joy in heaven, that maybe we do not understand heaven, maybe we can't explain heaven, maybe we, when people ask us what is heaven like, maybe we don't really know. But we know what God said about it, that it is a place of joy. And God knows how to grant us joy. He granted Adam and Eve joy in the beginning, and he can grant us joy now. But the kind of joy that we hunger for can only be found there in heaven. So the word of God reminds us that heaven is a place that exists, and it is a place of comfort, and it is a place that fulfills and satisfies all of our needs. Also, the word of God tells us what it is that we should do to enter into heaven. You know, sometimes there are, there are places that are very great in the world, and yet we have no means to reach them. 
There are some resorts, for instance, that people would love to go and to spend time in this resort, but it costs a thousand dollars a night to stay there. There are some very exclusive spots that only certain people with a certain high rank or status or money can attain. But heaven is free. Heaven is offered to all of us. And all you have to do is, is follow what the word of God says to attain it. So, and God gives us this book for free. He says, if you do these things and if you obey my words, then you will go to heaven. So the word of God should give us joy because it tells us the way. It's not a secret. It's not something that is only for a select few people. It's for everyone. Okay? It also tells us that God forgives us our sins. That even though sin is what separates us from God, God easily forgives. And we take this for granted that, that God forgives. That it is such a wonderful thing that no matter how many times I commit a sin, that when I stand before God and I ask him sincerely to forgive me, that I am forgiven. This is not something that is easy by any means. This is what kept all the patriarchs and prophets and righteous people in the Old Testament out of paradise. Because at that time, there was no forgiveness of sins. And yet now God has offered this to us freely, that if only we ask of him, he will forgive us. This should bring us joy when we read this in the word of God. Also, that the kind of joy we experience in heaven is not limited only to heaven. Because God says the kingdom of heaven is within you. Meaning that if heaven is within me, and that I am a temple of the Holy Spirit where God dwells, then I can enjoy the presence of God in my life even now. It's not something that I live in misery and darkness away from God, and then when I die, now I'm with God. No, I can actually live with God today. I can actually live with God right now, that I purify myself, that I remove from myself the things that separate me from God, that I spend time in meditating on God and spending time with Him. I spend my time being sanctified in the church through the sacraments, and in all these things that I find myself in the presence of God, and I experience heaven even while I'm on earth. And that finally, nothing can take this away from us. That even though we have an enemy, the enemy is defeated. Any one of us going up against the devil on our own would certainly be destroyed, and there would be nothing that we can do to overcome him. But God says, be of good cheer, I have overcome. I have overcome the world, I've overcome the devil, I've overcome all of your enemies for you, because you are too weak to overcome them yourself. This is something that should bring us joy. That even though we are weak, and even though we are sinful, that God does everything that we need, that we ourselves cannot do. So that's the first source of godly joy, is the word of God that has all these wonderful messages for us. The second source of joy is the church. In Psalm 122, verse 1, King David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is actually one of the psalms that's prayed by the priest on his way to the church. So I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. What is so joyful about the house of the Lord that when we go to it, we should be joyful? First is that we are baptized and receive the Holy Spirit in the church. This is the beginning of our walk of salvation. This is the beginning of our spiritual life, that God comes and dwells in us. Where did this happen? This happens in the church. Also, the church is the place where we're taught the word of God. So again, when we speak about the word of God and the joys in it, when we come to the church, we learn about the word of God. Also, we partake of God's body and blood, who he said was life-giving and necessary for our salvation. This is given to us again in the church. The church is a place where we confess our sins and that we hear the absolution from God that God has forgiven us our sins. The church is the place that we're healed from our spiritual sicknesses. The church is a place where we're allowed to participate and serve with God those people whom he loves. The church is a place where I am reminded of the mercies of God. The church is a place where I find myself with other believers that we can, we can encourage, encourage one another and help one another. All of these things happen in the church. And, these, and this is why we call the church like the first floor of heaven. That when we come to the church, we experience heaven. We are reminded of heaven. We are allowed to pray to God in peace. That we can come here and forget about the world outside and be allowed to speak with God freely. This is what brings us joy in the church. That we have a church and that we can come and pray together. The third source of godly joy is reconciliation with God. That I have, that I have, have peace with God again. Luke 15, 7 says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Imagine this scene that every time I repent that heaven is rejoicing, that heaven is encouraging me, that heaven is joyful because I have returned again to God once again. Reconciliation with God should bring us joy 
And maybe sometimes we don't think about this, of what great, great honor we have to have this. And actually that we have been created by God to be a special kind of creation, that no other creation that God has ever made is like us. None. Even when we look at the angels, who are far more powerful than us, Archangel Michael, who, who has not committed any sin, who is perfect, who is powerful, who is a being of light, who is created in heaven, who is a perfect servant of God, who has never disobeyed God at any time and done absolutely everything God has asked him to do. And yet in the eyes of God, God loves us more. And why is that? We have done nothing. We are weak. We are sinful. We Every day we go to God and we sin against him. Every day we tell him we're going to do good and we don't do good. Every day we are in need of repentance. Every day maybe we, we hurt our neighbor, the children of God that he loves. Every day we lack something. And yet God continues to love us and God considers us his children and God wants us to be united with him in a way that no other creation he has made can be united with him. Even the angels. Why? Why is this? Why is it that we are so honored and precious in the sight of God? I don't have an answer. There is no, there's no reason that we can imagine just out of the love that God has for us so much. that He loves us so much, he wants us to be with him. So to be considered children of God, this is the greatest honor. This is the greatest thing that can bring any of us joy because we have done nothing. We have done nothing to deserve it. And that not only this, but that after we disobeyed him and left him, that he sought after us and he brought us back again to himself so that we might benefit and that we might return to him and have the, the joy that he intended for us to have at the beginning. And that now when we die, we have hope. We have hope that we'll be returned to him again. Not like those in the Old Testament that when they died, they were separated from God. Also, maybe the reasons we, we don't think about this so much is because we take it for granted. We're not thinking so much about the danger of our destruction we don't think so much maybe about that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, living with us. These are all gifts. These are all gifts that God has given to us for our reconciliation with him. If we meditate on these things and think, of, think about them on a daily basis, maybe our worldly problems, our daily problems, the things that consume so much of our time and our effort and our thoughts and our feelings would take a second, you know, take a back seat to this idea of who we are, that we are Christians. And as Christians, we are honored by God. And as humans, he wants all of us to be his children. And that maybe this would also encourage us to go and speak to other people about him. That we want all the world to believe in him, to become his children, just as we are his children. And that we have done absolutely nothing to deserve this honor. But it is honor that has been given to us nonetheless. So these are sources of godly joy. These are reasons why. That maybe here in the world, we have sources of sorrow, that things that bother us, things that harm us, things that mistreat us. And yet none of these things can touch us. None of these things can determine our future, our destiny, because we are in the hands of God and God has protected us and continues to protect us forever. This is what should be our source of joy. Whatever pain, whatever suffering we feel today, we have joy that God has given us everything that we need for our salvation so that we might never depart from him and we might never go astray. So in conclusion, we talked about four types of godly sorrow. This godly sorrow leading to hope, leading to joy, leading to purification, leading to repentance. These are the kinds of sorrows that God allows so that we would be strengthened, that we would draw closer to him, even if it means temporary pain. We also spoke about the sources of godly joy, the word of God, <clears throat> the church, and reconciliation with God. That if we meditate on these things, <clears throat> whatever earthly problems we have, might seem insignificant in comparison. And glory be to God forever. Amen.